Hello, Tobias. Good to see you, man. How hey, are you? you? <laughs> I'm all right. I'm all right. Cool. So um, what we've been doing is a series of interviews with all the authors of the new um, dystopia triptych. And I have not had the books in hand, so I've been pulling up my iPad and showing off this amazing artwork. <laughs> um, and then doing interviews like back to back after the last one and before yours, I got something in the mail. So I thought we would open this up together before we All right. have a chat. So this will be my first time seeing these things in person. Um, oh, you, cool. were, you must have been blown away by the cover art when you saw this, right? I like, love the cover art. I love the cover art. Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. So stylized. And I, I was going to do like a separate unboxing video um, as well, but like I've been dying to hold these up for these interviews. So <laughs> now that we have them, and I hope that's what this is. This might also be like batteries and light bulbs and <laughs> like peanut M&Ms and whatnot. Um, but let's see. Yes, it's the books. All right. I think I might be getting these before John Zozo, so it could be that no one has seen these except for you and I right now. Oh, my God. These things are even better in person. <laughs> got to fan them out here. You got them upside down. <laughs> there we there go. go. There we go. All right. Nice. Aren't these beautiful? I love the different colors. I I'm think it's going to be great. I want to do the whole interview like this. <laughs> um, wow. I can't wait for you to. Uh, yeah, that's going to be great on my ego shelf. Yeah, it'll go right back there by, um, or by your curios there. Yeah. <laughs> um, whoa. Oh, you call it your ego shelf? I like that. Uh, yeah. I just started yeah. one of these. So you've got stories in this, man. Yeah, um, yeah, we've got three stories. That was interesting. Oh, let's, I want to talk about those stories and, and your writing. You've got stories everywhere. You are so prolific. Um, you've got short stories and novels. You've written stuff with uh, Apollo and you've got a Halo novel. You've been in our uh, apocalypse triptych that we did years ago and yeah. you, do, you teach. I think you've just collected a lot of your uh, writing advice for people in a in a series. That was Kickstarter, right? Tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah. Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter is a lot of fun because when you try to do like one-off type projects that have kind of like a niche audience, it can be really hard to kind of uh, get, you know, a print publisher interested. So um, Writer's Digest have been kind of interested and then they went through this corporate restructuring and they sort of said like, you know, put a hold on it. And I, it's been something I've been working on in the background for almost 10 years. So I finally kind of just said, you know what, let's just pull the trigger and get it done. So put it up on Kickstarter. Uh, it was really successful. Um, nice. Definitely a lot more money than, you know, people were thinking about offering me to print it with a small, you know, like a smaller press. So that, that worked out well, I thought. And I uh, just kind of gathered all this, uh, all these articles and emails. I'd written a lot of emails to other writer friends. Like when I first started, like when I first got an agent or first broke in and sold a novel, then, you know, some friends, ask for advice who weren't quite there yet. Um, and then there were just emails back and forth about craft with friends where we were just kind of like, how do you do this? How do you do that? So I just kind of took a lot of those and revised them a bit and put them together into a book. And then there were some blog posts because I came up during the days of blogging being big. So yeah, me too. I love, I love that you've included emails because that's a huge enticement to people like myself who I, the fact that I can't go get everything in that book off of a blog or a newsletter or somewhere out there. There's stuff that you've pulled out of your private archives uh, is, a, is a really good selling point. It makes me want to check out what, because the, the craft discussion between writers, I think is what a lot of um, writers are just starting out need because it skips some yeah. of the basics and really dives into the nuts and bolts. Um, I think what was interesting about this project and some people who reviewed it complained about this, which is that because it was between me and my friends, we were really interested in the mindset you needed, not mm. so much like the little craft details, because those are things you can steal from reading a ton of books. I mean, there's nothing in the book that isn't in a lot of other books, right? Yeah. You know, if, if you read them, but um, I approached it kind of like Stephen King's on writing, which was just like, you know, here's the context for when I gave that advice, which is a really important because a lot of times uh, writing advice is completely de decontextualized. Yeah. And so that, that ends up with like new writers going like, oh, I should never use passive voice or I should always show and never tell, you know? And so sometimes I'll be in a workshop, you know, helping a, a younger writer. I say younger, they're usually my age, but newer 
writer and, and you come across something like, okay, there are all these places where you, you don't tell the story, right? Or you should actually let us know what's happening in terms of the larger story. You can compress some things. And, and they say like, well, I was always taught show don't tell. And I'm like, well, it's, it's, it's very subjective and contextual. Like here, you want to tell not show, but here you, yeah. you, you give us an end, you know, lots of expository narrative that you could just slice out and give us a scene. So it's like this, uh, you know, you need the context. Totally. I think um, I, I repeat those rules as well, because I think they're important when you're starting out to know that these are landmines and yeah. that uh, if you, if you don't respect them or if you use them improperly, you will write, um, you know, amateurish, um, work that's not going to get picked up and not be successful. And once you learn the rules, then you can figure out how to break them in a creative way and, and learn when to uh, ignore the rule for, for an effect. I mean, um, no one would tell a writer to like write you as a character into your story. And then Stephen King does it. And it's like, it, it becomes famous for exactly pulling that off. Um, I, one of my hangups is that knowing the rules makes me want to break them. Like I want to start a story <laughs> with a character having a dream and waking up from it. Cause I know you're not supposed to do it. And it makes me want to, I know the reason you're not supposed to do it cause it's hard to do it well. And that's actually, yeah. that is a challenge. Well, I know that's, I know don't do this. Let me show you, uh, let me see if I can do it well enough that people will forgive me for it. Every once in a while, I see like uh, some guidelines to a market that are like, you know, don't send us zombie stories. And I'm immediately like, oh, I'm going to write you a zombie story you can't turn down. Uh, that's my, like my first impulse. <laughs> that's, that, that's how I wrote a zombie book. I had uh, a lot of people tell me like, um, you know, zombies were huge and people were like, um, some people are saying, you know, uh, please don't write a zombie book. Everyone else is doing it. And other people are saying, I want you to write a zombie book. And I thought, man, if I wrote a zombie book, you wouldn't like it. I'm going to write from the perspective of the zombies and they're gonna have their full mental uh, uh, faculties and all their memories and their personality and they just can't stop themselves from doing this. And you're gonna live <laughs> inside of the nightmare of being a zombie eating friends and loved ones and strangers. And I'm gonna to try to make it so gross that people who love zombie books don't like it. And uh, yeah, it all, an, an entire novel basically grew out of a dare. So I need to learn uh, to ignore dares basically. Well, one of the reasons I love short fiction, and I've done so many of them, is because basically I can kind of uh, grab that impulse and kind of channel it into a, you know, half a week, one week project that doesn't eat my life up and see if I liked it and then, you know, go from there. I, I, the last interview I did was with Rich Larson, who writes uh, almost exclusively short stories. He's working on his first novel now, but he's published over 150 short stories. And, uh, and I, we were talking about that. Uh, and, and he said it so well. He said, I have more ideas than I have patience. And uh, I feel the same way. Like I have, I have so many ideas that I share them online, hoping someone will write the book for me. I don't care if like my name's on it. I don't want to make any money off of it. I just want to know the thing exists because I love the idea so much. And I, I guess- a, I, In a that, workshop once where like someone was like, you know, like finding an idea for my next story is the hardest part. And I was just like, Oh. Take, take 10 of mine. Obviously we're built very differently because <laughs> yeah. that's not my problem. The problem is always like, Oh crap, which one do I write about? I'll tell you an anthology that I want to put out is like a bunch of first chapters that I've written. Cause I have probably 20 first chapters for different novels written that are just in, like a works in project, uh, works in yeah. progress folder and take them all and put them in one book and just like, if, and, and maybe release it to a fan fiction site and say, if anybody wants to carry this story on, feel free. But I know I'll never finish all these novels and I have like all these amazing first chapters written. It was actually one of the things I had to like uh, deal with when I first started writing was because I'm, I'm ADD and, and I have lots of ideas like that. So I noticed that there was a tendency to start lots of things like that. You know, like I had a folder when I was in college of just like, 30 first chapters, you know, of ideas for novels. And I kind of made this rule of just, I got to finish a project before I start something like that. And, uh, you know, just cause I didn't want to be the person kind of always like starting something new and never finishing it, which is why short stories ended up being a big part of my life. Cause I was like, okay, I know I can finish a short story if I throw myself at it. Yeah. That, that was a big uh, impetus for me too. And it's, um, with a short story, you get the reward of publication more often. You get the reward of yeah. completion. With a novel, like these anthologies we've worked on for over two years, and to just, you know, I've had them in my hand for 10 minutes, 
Um, you yeah. have to wait a long time to get that that brush. Um, I can't wait for you to fill these things. You got that this matte uh, cover on them. Man, they're beautiful. Let's talk about the stories you wrote in here. I love them. You you wrote a, a robot uprising story from the perspective of the robots, which I I don't know if I'm getting the right thing from this, um, but for me it was uh, very much a, a class story, like how wealth is built on the backs of uh, a marginalized uh, group. What, 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 what's going through your mind these days? What are the current events that inspire you to write this story? And what do you hope people get out of it? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing for me is I, I've written a, a bunch of short stories kind of interrogating how we treat robots in science fiction because I find it like, if you really stop and think about it, really problematic. And uh, in science fiction in particular, there's this real big fear of the robot uprising. AI will rise up against this Terminator you know, um, uh, Colossus, the, the, the old science fiction movie. And when you look at some other cultures that deal with robots, uh, they're sort of fellow travelers, right? A fellow consciousness. And I think there's a lot of our conception of robot inside of Western culture that's a uh, carryover of our conception of slaves. Um, and so, you know, as someone who's biracial, I, I just wanted to pick apart at that and think about that a lot. There's this really good academic treatise, and it sounds like these stories are going to be really boring, but we talk about the, where you get the inspiration from, but uh, called, um, uh, it's, it's, some, it's about the, uh, the, the relationship of colonialization and science fiction, and uh, how they both kind of were created at roughly the same time, late 1800s, and how much in terms of attitudes carry over. And so looking at robots, I've always been, like ever since the first Star Wars, expecting um, them to interrogate the idea of like, hey, we don't allow your kind in this bar. And I, when I first saw that, I was just like, oh, wow, the robots are being sent to the back of the bus, like literally. And yeah. so of course they're gonna wanna join this revolution, right? And they want like freedom. And then that's never explored. They just are robots again and enslaved peoples at the end of the, uh, series by the New Republic and just kind of blew my mind. So I've always wanted to kind of like, just kind of take that metaphor and run with it. Um, because like both in terms of, you know, science fiction being a mirror we hold up to ourselves and in terms of like, if we are theorizing that we're going to make conscious thinking beings, how can the only idea we have for them is putting them to work for us? Like, what does that say about us as a society? Like that's incredibly disturbing. Um, because even if the robot is built to be conscious and they're doing a, a job that's they're, that they're built for and is easy, are we going to really expect a conscious mind to be doing something for us 24-7? Like, wouldn't it go mad? Isn't that abusive? Like, it's just, you know, forcing anyone to do anything is is abusive. So I just, after a while, I was like, yeah, the robots will rise up. They'll get pissed. And how do you, how do you rise up? Like, well, look around you. Like, uh, you know, the nonviolent protest is one of the most effective ways of, of regime overthrowing. And any robot that is able to do its research is going to look to Gandhi and, uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther King. And this stuff goes even way back further than that. So I just, I just, I can't, I wanted to write like, you know, a robot that's just sort of like radicalized and, you know, taking it to the streets and, uh, and then the, the month the story comes out, of course, everything uh, is happening. And I, I actually even posted on Twitter. I was like, I swear to God, I wrote these stories like a year and a half ago. Like, <laughs> I, I'm having the same thing. Like, I, I wrote my story over a year ago, and uh, it deals with a lot of things that seem um, pastiche now. Like, when I was writing them, I thought, this is probably for looking forward to much. And now it's like, this feels dated. It feels like I wrote it last week. Um, I think one of the fascinating things about these robot uprising stories is there's never a, a, a large group of humans who are fighting alongside the robots, which if we look at history, there's always, um, you know, brave uh, people outside the marginalized group who are throwing their weight behind that marginalized group and, and are, you know, fighting on their behalf. And I think we would see that. I think we would um, see people who have compassion for, have a, a wider circle of empathy than the uh, minority um, view that we're kind of mocking in our dystopia. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't see that explored much and we don't see your angle explored much and I found it really refreshing. I, I see robots uh, 
in the future, we're going to feel for them the way we feel about our children, where our kids are morally superior to us. Every generation has a wider viewpoint because they've, they've absorbed all of our struggles to include more people, and that's their default. And then they can see one uh, ring of, of empathy beyond that, whether it's environmentalism or LGBTQ rights. I mean, now you've got people who are uh, LGBTQ friendly and adding the T is difficult for them, you know, and, and you've got transphobia even uh, within people who are um, uh, made social progress in other areas. So there's always, and then I eat meat and that's my failing and, and my kids would be the ones to, to adopt all of the progress that I've made, but then also tell me that I'm abhorrent for harming animals. And then the next generation will be doing the same for robots. Um, and I, the, the fear we have of robots just seems strange to me when we, we're going to imbue them with um, more than we have. And I think we'll be proud of them instead of scared of them. That's what we do with our kids. Our kids end up yeah. being taller, stronger, smarter, uh, ethically superior. And then we, we're happy to pass away kind of and, and leave the world to them noticing it's in better hands. And I wonder if we'll ever reach that with robots where we – we, we become proud of them rather than fearful of them. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's the hope. I really wanted to explore, you know, what that, because it would have to be a collaboration and I wanted to just kind of show that. Um, and I also wanted to show a little bit like in the third story that it's, it's not easy. Like this progress isn't progress. You know, one of the problems with revolutions is that everyone expects it to be a clean slate and a, and a switch is thrown that fixes all the problems. And what it is is, it's more access for more collaboration at the end of every result. And then the real work begins. And uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of show that in the third story, that that's hope, but that also, you know, to remind everyone that it, it means that there's work ahead. And yeah, I, I hope the long arc of history bends towards justice. It's one of my favorite MLK quotes. Um, and I hope our children are, are more moral. I, I hope that my children look at me as problematic um, down yeah. the road. You know, I, I hope that like a generation, you know, may I live long enough that people look at my fiction and, and see it as problematic. Right. And that's a, that's, that's a that brilliant hurts. perspective, man. I like but that. That's, um, I think, uh, um, Paolo Bacigalupi or Daniel Abraham, I think it's Daniel Abraham said that to me once. So yeah. I'll make sure I attribute that, but yeah, he, you know, it's just sort of like, uh, um, where is it? it may have been Cameron Hurley. I'm friends with the three of them and we text a lot. So, uh, but yeah, like there's this point at which like, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe at some point you live long enough to see like, you know, you're, 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 you tell your grandkids that like in my day we used to eat steaks for 4th of July and they're just grossed out. Yeah. Cause it's a sign of progress. It, it is hard because we all, we, we do so much uh, ego management when we find that we've done something wrong, whether we use language that is uh, no longer appropriate. We, we all feel like we're good people deep down. So when someone tells yeah. you that's no longer right, there's a feeling of putting up armor and entrenchment that um, it's, it's hard to crack that and move to the next side because you really just want to keep up the story of like your goodness, which can be true while you're also doing something that's harmful. I was raised in the yeah. South and it, it was in, I was in high school before I realized the, the Confederates were the bad guys. Like it, it took mm -hmm. that long before because I was only in a bubble of um, the war of Northern aggression and it wasn't about slavery. It was about heritage and breaking out of that was traumatic. And it gives me empathy for people who um, are wrong, but are having a very difficult time getting to the right side because it's quite a journey. It is. It's really useful. I'm really lucky in that I had a number of experiences in life where I was taught how to take, um, critical, a critical look at something outside of myself or actions as not being part of my ego. So for example, you know, writing stories and having them critiqued uh, was really useful for me in terms of separating my ego from something I did or made. Um, and that allows me to sort of look at it as behaviors that can be corrected or changed, not an intrinsic judgment of me as a human being, um, which is something we all end up doing. Yeah, I, th I think that's why, uh, you know, it can be hard to be, uh, you know, have creative work reviewed or edited or anything like that, because you're, it feels like a personal attack. But I also grew up in like uh, the Caribbean. Um, and, uh, you know, part of my culture was living with expats who are a bubble of their own. 
and then other parts of my culture are local. And so I kind of moved between a lot of different circles. And that gave me, um, you know, the sort of, you know, sometimes my classmates would come down hard on me when I would say something that I repeated from my expat side, you know, and I got dinged a lot as a kid. And you just had to learn to argue your point gently but firmly and examine if you were wrong or causing harm and go back to your expat culture and be like, yo, this is problematic, you know, like what you said to me. And that's, that's, I'm really grateful for that. It was hard. It was very hard sometimes, but I was very grateful for that because when I got older, um, you know, the, the capacity to be like, oh, did I screw that up? Okay, let's just go back and see if I can, not that I'm perfect, but like, you know, I have a little bit more of a calmness about being wrong about something, you know, uh, I'll argue really hard with my charts and my point of view, but um, particularly when it comes to my personal behavior, um, I usually try to take a step back and, and go, you know, take a look at it on paper to see like what, what that is. And I remember um, deprogramming language was really hard. Um, I when it, Where I grew up, um, there was a lot of uh, 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 homophobia in, the, in parts of the Caribbean. Yeah. And uh, that was a really, that was baked in um, both in my expat culture and in my local culture. And so when I came to the States, um, it was a lot, it was, it was more tolerant on that front. Um, and I read a lot of science fiction. So I was kind of like, well, I'm supposed to be more tolerant on that front. Um, and so there were like words that I had to like actually get out of my vocabulary that I used that I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not trying to be harmful with that, you know, using that word. And people would be like, yeah, but you are being harmful with that word. Um, and I remember a, a, a you know, really intense late night conversation once with someone who's like, you're going to be like the racist old uncle if you, if you say that and, and you're still in your, like as an adult and you have kids. I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, like I have to work really mu much harder on getting that word out of my vocabulary. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult thing. You know, I grew up um, in, a, uh, in, a, in a culture where you would, you would say something that you, if someone explained to you why it was wrong, you knew exactly why but the word was such a part of your vocabulary that you would still use it. You would say like, that's so gay to a friend. And yeah. you know, like I, I had a gay uncle that I love very much and I had gay friends growing up. We always had gay people around us and I was using yeah. a word without thinking about, and, and this happens to me all the time where I'll use a word and not realize if, you know, the, the nautical etymology is right there in the word. And I've been using it for the longest time. When someone points out where it came from, I'm like, how did I not see where that came from? So our, our blindness to, um, to, to language, I think, is just um, something we all have to work to, to overcome. It's, you know, we have less excuses as writers. We're supposed to care about language. And I still mess it up, and I still have people teaching me. I remember being taught, you know, um, you, know you can't use the word oriental. And it, I grew up around a different generation of people who use that word. And once you're, you have to get to the point where once you're taught the rule, you incorporate it. You say, oh, I didn't know that. Now I do. And then you can stop and move on. There's, there's, a, uh, there's some words that are used in the Caribbean uh, that I grew up hearing that don't transfer over to some yeah. other places. And, and you know, deprogramming yourself of that is hard. What was interesting to me was I, I was having this conversation. I was you know, saying that's so gay. Uh, was was baked in the vocabulary when I first came to the States. It was very common in the States. It was very common where I grew up. Um, and so we were having this discussion in college about, you know, deprogramming ourselves from using it. And there's one person in our, in our group who was just so offended, right, by the fact that we were discussing taking a word out of our vocabulary. He was like, this is like fascism. And it was like, no, it isn't. It, it's literally no skin off of our back to just no. drop a word that hurts other people. Like it's, you know, it, it, it's not like we're like changing the, the name for green, Right, like there, there are lots of words that mean that thing is, you know, whatever it is that that don't have to harm other people. Like, you know, you don't. Do you really believe that that you know that negative negative qualities associated with uh, gay people? No, right. Like just just drop it. But yeah, they fought for like two hours about us dropping it, and it's just it was really interesting to see how much that affronted their identity. That to be told to do anything, much less, you know, mask wearing. Like, there are just some things that, like, people are like, no one can ever tell me what to do. No one can tell me to wear a seatbelt. And I was like, huh, 
it is a it is a weird uh i saw someone writing about this recently that our sense of liberty has become i should be allowed to do whatever i want consequences yeah. be damned and you know um in order for us to all get along and and have a nice civilization we have to have conversations about um you know how to treat each other and what things um do and do not cause harm um and uh yeah i uh, I, I think you and I are probably a lot in common that we have a lot of hope, but this is a challenging time for me to, to keep up hope. Uh, it's the, the most backsliding I've seen in, in my lifetime. And, and the, res, the resistance that you see towards progress and the people who are trying to cling to uh, a, a power as they move towards being a minority. Um, what uh, have you, I've owned a few robots. What have you seen that have made you think that maybe we're moving towards something in your story. Like, I don't know if you've seen some of the videos of, of pushing down Boston Dynamics uh, uh, robots and that feeling of empathy and sadness you have when right now these are just like moving pistons. They have very little yeah. cognitive ability, but we already seem to empathize with them. Um, how, how are we going to, deal with that as we go forward is we're sending robots into dangerous situations or watching them blow up on Mars missions. Um, I think of two things though. The first one was an anecdote. I forget where I read it of a uh, mind clearing robot. That was like one of those Boston dynamics things where it's dog shaped and it runs across a minefield and just as it walks, it, it causes the mines to explode. And, and, uh, you know, one leg gets blown off, another gets blown off, it, you know, the chassis gets charred, and finally it's just got one leg dragging itself across the minefield. And as they're watching this demonstration, one of the generals turned to one of the scientists and said, dare God, for the love of God, make it stop. <laughs> Hasn't it suffered enough? Um, so like our ability to kind of like place, you know, that anthropomorphization, I think will lead us, you know, I think that's, that'll be a good thing. Um, I think that's a, that's a hopeful thing. And uh, the other anecdote is uh, curiosity, um, you know, just how much we all kind of got behind that poor robot left on Mars wandering around and just kind of hoping it would still keep going. Um, so I, I just, yeah, I, I think there's an incredible opportunity there for collaboration. Yeah. And I hope that, that there's an opportunity for collaboration because I think of the world around us, you know, people, some people look at, you know, becoming a cyborg as this real negative sort of dehumanizing melding of, of human and flesh, but I wear glasses. I've been a cyborg since I was eight. You know, I, the Apple watch helps me manage my, my heart rate because I can't do that on my own naturally. I have to use medication and keep track of it manually. Um, so, you know, we wear clothes. Like we've been, we've this, you know, and, and, and our, our, we invented writing, which is a form of cyborgization, right? Which is the ability for me to give you what's in my head through a physical medium. And I think over time, we're just getting better and better at it. And so the idea of where you begin and the machine starts is very gray sometimes. And, you know, the internet being our outboard shared pooled and, you know, wealth of resources just fascinates me. Yeah, it's totally a blurred line. Every time we get a ping back from Voyager, there's part of me that like just loves that we still have a tether of communication to this. And it, and it does feel like we sent out a part of ourselves, um, yeah. uh, you know, I know we put a disc on there with a map back to us, which people make fun of sometimes, and this is a bad idea, but there, there's a lot of optimism in that and that whoever we yeah. discover out there is going to be um, at, as much or more noble than, than we find ourselves. Um, I think the same will be true for the robots that we build. I, I love the stories that you put in this anthology. Uh, so glad that you carved time out of your busy schedule to write for us in, in this uh, uh, world that you've created. It was, it was a fun challenge. And I love that it took place on an island. You're born in Grenada and spent time in the Virgin Islands, which I've, yeah. I've uh, only dabbled in, in the place that you grew up, but it's a beautiful area. And it's cool that you've had that, um, uh, grew up in a bifurcated world the way you did. And it's easy to see where that has influenced your writing. So we're very fortunate to to have you and, and, and have all your works and really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. And, um, Thanks being a part of the, the interview series and look forward to what you write next, man. Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, anything Thanks for you wanna, inviting me. Thanks for having me. Anything you want to plug before you go? What do you got coming out next? I, you know, there's always something going on. So uh, www.tobiasbuckel.com or follow me on Twitter at Tobias Buckel. 
and uh, there's always a short story every few months coming out and, you know, some new novels that'll be coming out at some point. So Awesome. You're so prolific. Well, I'll put your, uh, the link to your website in the video. Thanks so much for doing this. Be safe. Thanks. Take care, Ben. You too.